Hey Rune, Raptors Spank here, and today I have something new for my flesh and blood audience, but something kind of a return to classic for people who followed me back in the Legends of Rune Terra Day, which is that I'm doing a deck guide. So those of you that are unfamiliar with this, I'll be breaking down a deck. Uh, essentially, I'll have a number of different like slides, kind of breaking the, the deck down into different components. I'm going to go over all the different components, why these cards are important, and just kind of the overall feel for the deck. Um... Unlike the Legends of Runeterra ones, there won't be gameplay following it because there's no easy way to test or, or play the deck online. So I am and I'm not going to do that sort of aspect of it. It's just going to be a deck guide. But we're going to talk about the deck and go over all the main board cards, the equipment sideboard, and then also some flex spots, some different cards that you can bring in if you want to kind of tweak the deck a little bit to be your own. So who are we covering this first week? Um, there's a lot of Runeblade content on this uh, channel, and I originally thought that this first deck guide I was going to do was going to be Dash, because she's one of my favorite heroes, if not my just all-time favorite hero, but there's a certain hero that's been oft-requested to provide the list for, and I've revamped the list, and had a ton of fun playing this character. So today we are covering Viserai, and so we're going to kind of go over how Viserai works, and then the deck... But to give you a basic idea, this Viserai deck, I completely scrapped the original one that you'll see in one of the earlier Pauper videos, and I built a new deck back when you were allowed to have six rares in the deck, and it was a ton of fun, and I was really excited about it, and then the new commoner format came out, and I had to change the list, but ultimately I realized that it was not that big of a nerf for the Viserai deck, because I lost two or uh, four copies of Mauvrian Skies and two copies of uh, Blue Oath of the Ark Knight, but they were very easy to replace, which we'll kind of get into more details later. But let's start off by just kind of going over what Viserai is and how he works. Now, just to be clear about what kind of deck this Viserai deck is, it is an aggro deck, as I would call it, except instead of a go-wide aggro deck, like the uh, Briar deck that we covered in the very first episode of our Commoner Vodcast, this is more of a uh, go-tall aggro deck, where you're not going to do a bunch of attacks, but your turn is going to be focused on just very proactively killing your opponent and doing it with these huge attacks. So, first off, Viserai is the generic Runeblade hero, so what's important here is he does not get the shadow cards that Chain gets or the elemental cards that Briar gets. He just gets the generic Runeblade cards available to everyone. So, why not just build this, uh, this same deck with a different hero? That ultimately comes down to Viserai's ability being very good. So, specifically, whenever you play a Runeblade card, if you've played another non-attack action card this turn, you create a Rune Chant. What's very important about this is that for many heroes in Flesh and Blood, their hero ability will say something like once per turn effect or once per turn action. Um, Briar used to be like Viserai, but now has been eroded into a once per turn effect of creating her embodiments. Um, and Chain is a once per turn action. Viserai does not have that restriction. This can trigger multiple times a turn. So what's important by this is if you play a non-attack action card and then you play a rune blade non-attack action card, you'll create a rune chant. And then if you play a rune blade attack, you'll create another rune chant. <laughs> so basically you can create a ton of rune chants using this because if you can get multiple attacks in, after casting a non-attack action card, you'll create rune chants off every single attack. It just lets you spiral out of control with these great rune chants. And they also really, really help our go tall strategy because they just add these great sources of arcane damage to all of our normal attacks. So that's the big reason that we're running Viserai is that he creates more rune chants than ev every other uh, rune blade and he does very very well at these kind of ghost tall strategies since those are all going to boost his damage output. So the basic concept here is as you see we need to play a non-attack action card to start creating these rune chants so we have a bunch of non-attack action cards and then we pair them with some just generically great rune blade attacks that we can use to eventually hit our opponent but let's start with the non-attack action cards kind of go over the full list of them and what each one is doing in the deck so to start off we're going to cover the pump spells because we have six of them in the deck so it is a sizable part of the deck that's um you know, uh, over an eighth of the deck is just pump spells. So we have the pretty standard ones you'll see in most decks, which is two red come to fights, two red warmongers recitals. These are really simple. They cost one. They give your next attack plus three. 
Warmonger's Recital has this extra benefit of if that attack hits, it'll go back into our deck, which helps keep us from, you know, decking out and running out of things we can do, which is really, really nice. Um, I tend to favor Warmongers over Come to Fight, even though Come to Fight can block for more. But in our case, we want both. And we're only running the red copies of them because we really just want that plus three attack. Um, once you start going into the to the higher pitch value ones, they start doing a lot less. Um, there is some argument for running a blue Warmongers Recital, but we'll cover that later when we talk about flex spots. And finally, two copies of Slogism. This is a little bit of a personal choice of mine, but I'm a huge fan of Slogism in Viscerai especially because we have a ton of attacks that have a cost of two or greater. Um, sometimes that will cost us a lot less, but still count for this. So this is essentially, we needed another pump spell that was going to pitch for three, and Slogism is the highest damage output pump spell you can do that pitches for three. Now, it does come at a huge cost. It costs three to, to cast, but it's just the upside is so prominent, and generally speaking, you are just going to pitch this to pay for something else. That's the big point of the blue cards here. This is like a non-attack action card when you've got nothing else, but generally speaking, you're actually just going to use this to pay for your other stuff, so it's not a huge concern how much it costs. And, I mean, I have cast Slogism more than once playing Viscerai, and it's very fun every time you do it. You can get away with some massive attacks. So, I love Slogism. Um, this was one of those things where I had the blue Oath to the Arknights when we were allowed to have rares. I replaced that with Slogism because it actually pumps for way more than Oath and only costs one more, but it loses the downside of not creating a rune chant automatically, but it helps us do so with Viscerai. So, yeah, two copies of Slogism blue to round out our pump spells. Now let's talk about some of our utility non-attack action cards. We have another, uh, well, six copies of Lead the Charge alone, and then another four utility uh, non-attack action cards, which brings us to a total of 16, so almost half of our deck is non-attack action cards, which means that we should have no trouble getting set up to start going off with uh, Viscerai. And essentially, we just need one non-attack action card in a turn, and then we can do a bunch of different attacks to still get all of our rune chance. So as long as we have that one non-attack action card, which is why we are running 16. Right off the bat, though, let's talk about the one we're running all six copies of. Lead the charge. Two red, two yellow, two blue. It's one of the best non-attack action cards, bar none, in the game, uh, and let alone uh, in commoner. Um, we discussed this in our top 10 generic cards in uh, Commoner, one of our early vodcast episodes, and we put Lead the Charge at first because this is such an exceptional card. And what it just says is that the next time you play an attack action card with a cost dependent on what the pitch of, of this card is, um, you gain an action point. So this is just a uh, free way to essentially give go again to one of your attacks because it costs zero so it's free to use it has go again on it so it's one of the best non-attack action cards we can have in a viscerite deck because it has go again and it costs zero so it's just a free card to play it has go again so we can follow it up with an attack and that's just everything we want in this deck now what's also important here is so the red one lets us do anything that costs zero or more gains an action point yellow is one or more gains an action point and blue is two or more gains an action point. So what's important here is that the blue one is going to have some miss in the deck. Once you see more of our attack actions, you'll understand this. There's a few one costs in there that this will not apply to, but the vast majority of our attacks work with the blue one, so we're not really punished for running it, and it's another good blue, uh, blue pitch. So we do love to have some of those, because oftentimes our non-attack action cards, as we saw with the pump spells, those all cost one or more. So the blue one can pitch to pay for like a come to fight and the attack that follows it up generally. So that's why we want the blues. The yellow will hit virtually everything in the deck. The one exception is that there is a non-attack action card, which you can see on the screen here, read the runes, which costs zero and doesn't have go again. So we can't use the yellow lead the charge for that, but we can use the red one for, for that. But the yellow one does work for every other card in the deck for gaining an action point. So basically works on everything since we're not usually going to go lead the charge read the runes although if you do do <laughs> if you do lead the charge into read the runes you will get a rune chant off that which is very nice and then the red one is there just because we need one more source of a uh, go again so when i had the rares i only ran the blue lead the charge and then i ran mavrian skies for the other four slots 
but without Mavrian Skies available in Commoner, just replacing them with the other four colors of Lead the Charge essentially does the same thing for the deck and is very, very solid. Whispers of the Oracle, we're almost never going to cast it, is the idea. It's really here for a pitch three that happens to be a non-attack action card with Go Again built in. But the nice thing here is if we have no other non-attack action cards, we could play this for zero. It has Go Again. It has everything we need to set up the Viscerai Rune Chant production. So that's the primary reason it's here for. We don't really care about Opt. I mean, it can be nice for kind of sculpting our hands, but it's really just here as a pitch three that can occasionally be a zero-cost non-attack action card. And finally, Read the Runes. This does have one problem. This card does not have Go Again. So unless we have a lead the charge to give it go again, or we crack our boots to give it go again, which we'll discuss later on, this will be our entire turn, which is very tragic. But if you have like two non-attack actions, you can play one and then read the runes and you'll still get an extra rune chant. But the big thing is, this gives us three rune chant tokens, which is one of our most explosive starts, especially if we're, like, going first and we're probably not going to force damage through. We can always use our turn to just create three rune chants and then arsenal a card, and now our opponent's like, oh, well, I didn't get to use any of these cards in my hand, and you just went off. So it is really, really good for that, but we're not running any of the other colors because they're very terrible when they can't have go again. That was one of the biggest mistakes I made originally, is that when I... Built Viscerai, I had all three colors of Read the Runes, and since it does not have Go Again, it does not work well in the deck. But we are willing to run the Reds, just because it is so powerful. Now, going into attacks, right off the bat, we have our big, big Aura Matters kind of attacks, and then Singeing Steel Blade as well. But we're going to talk about the big Aura Matters cards first. I've just gone over how easy it is for us to make a bunch of rune chants since we can go non-attack action card and then any rune blade card. Um, generally speaking, that's going to be these attacks. We're going to play a non-attack action card and then follow it up with one of these Aura Matters cards. Now, these just say on them that if you've played or created an Aura this turn, they gain their effect. So what's important about this is that you don't have to have the rune chant before you play the card. If you play the card and it creates the rune chant, it will still meet the conditions for them. And since the Viscerai trigger happens before the attack goes onto the chain, it also means that things like Drowning Dire that gain Dominate will have Dominate before your opponent can block. So the big things here, Shrill of the Skull Form is our best attack in the deck. Um, it gains plus three if we've created an aura. So it's going to be anywhere from 5 to 7 power, which is huge. That's why we're still running the blue one, because it's only 2 power, but we're almost always going to give it the plus 3. So then that's a pitch 3 that attacks for 5, which is crazy. It's super good for the deck. And it synergizes with all of our 2 cost matters things. So like, blue lead the charge works on this. The slogism can pump this. And we have equipment that can also affect this. So... Really, really good. One of our, if not just straight up best attacks in the deck. Drowning Dire is really nice because it can gain Dominate. So if we have a bunch of pump spells and we fire them off on a Drowning Dire, this can just like one turn kill our opponent. Um, because even with like a Warmongers, now this is swinging for eight with Dominate. So we're pretty much guaranteed to get five through. It's not 100% accurate, but we're going to get a lot of damage through. And then if it hits, you also get to put a non-attack action card back into your deck, which we do have slightly less non-attack action cards than attacks. So getting to cycle some of them back into our deck is just really, really nice. So just an all-around great card that can kind of serve as a good finisher for us. Reek of Corruption is just, I, I needed one more attack that does a decent bit of damage. So it's a two-cost attack, so all of our two-cost matters works with it. And if we've created an aura this turn which we do fairly regularly this just gains a nice boost that if it hits them they're going to have to discard a card which is great because this has four power so it's a little bit hard for them to block but this is probably our weakest attack and our easiest one to get rid of in certain ways next up we do have a blue card we have singeing steel blade this is just kind of a good utility card here it's basically we needed one more attack but it needed to pitch for three so the, there's a couple other choices for this spot, but I'm going to talk about why Singeing Steel Blade is so good. One, when it attacks, you deal one arcane damage. This is It doesn't require any conditions. It's just one extra point of arcane damage, and forcing our opponent to deal with two different sources of damage is really, really good. 
Um, it's a cheap attack at only one cost, but the nice thing is, being a one cost means that most of our lead the charges work. The blue will not, but the yellow and the red will work with Singeing Steel Blade to give it essentially pseudo go again. And it's a nice little chip damage of two, so people don't want to block it because it's not three damage, so they'll be over blocking most times. But it's going to do a sizable amount of damage if they don't block, so it kind of incentivizes our opponent to overblock or kind of lose out on some of the block value on it to stop us from getting some damage in and if they don't we do get a decent chip in so this is just a great utility value attack that fits nicely into our curve now let's talk about the rune chant package rune chant matters attack so first up we do have four copies of meet and greet we have the blue and the red because we needed both we needed more blue attacks so that's kind of why singeing steel blade made it in but same for meet and greet and then we have the red because the red is the best one. But essentially, if meet and greet hits, you do create a rune chant token. And then the best part about meet and greet is that if you've dealt arcane damage this turn, it does gain go again, which is really, really nice because even if we haven't found our non-attack action cards or we haven't found a way or we've run out of ways to give our attacks go again, this has a built-in way to give itself go again. And at the cost of one, it is an attack that we can very often chain multiple attacks in turn with. So it's just really, really solid. And also your opponent's going to want to block because if they don't, you're going to create a rune chant, which is super important for the other cards later on this slide. So it's just your opponent's going to have to block it. And for the four, they're going to have to way over block it. For the two, they're going to block it, even though it's only two damage because they don't want you to create the rune chant. Um... And if you already have rune chants that are going to be exploding to give this go again, they're going to want to pitch to, to absorb it so you don't gain go again. And it just forces them to lose a lot more resources than cards of this value would typically do. So that's why it's great in the deck. Then we have four copies of Spellblade Strike because it's honestly one of the best rune blade attacks just in general. Um... It would probably see a lot more play in Chain and Briar if not for the fact that both of them are doing very unique things that prevent them from taking advantage of just all-around great utility cards like this. And the reason it's so good is that it does have the good power levels, uh, two for the blue, four for the, the red, which I've talked about how great that is for bad blocks for your opponent. But the nice thing here is it also creates a rune chant. So no matter what happens, you will get a rune chant out of this, which is really great if you have a way to give this go again, and you're going to follow it up with, like, Shrill of the Skull form. Even if you don't have a non-attack action card, you can still create a rune chant to get that Aura Matters condition for those attacks. So it's just really, really solid, and at a one cost, it means most of your lead to charges will give this go again. Then we have two copies of Red Rune Flash. This is where we get into the real good Rune Chant engine aspects. Because we are so good at creating Rune Chants and we have so many ways to do so, we can run a lot of greedy cards like this. Because this costs three and deals four, which on paper seems really bad, but it costs one less to play for each Rune Chant you have. So we often can make this a zero cost attack. Now we get into the real sweet parts of Rune Flash though. It already has go again. So if we can make this super cheap, we can just play this for like free or one, get go again automatically off of it, and follow it up with a second attack, which is awesome. But this still counts as a three cost attack, even if we're paying zero for it, which means all of our two cost matters cards, like the equipment I've mentioned, but also slogism, those all work on Rune Flash, even if it's free. So really, really awesome from that aspect, and for the same reasons, we have four copies of Amplify the Arknight, which is probably our second best attack in the deck, because the blue one swings for four, the red one swings for six. They look like they cost three, but they cost one less for every rune chance, so you can make this pretty cheap, like one to zero is, in cost is actually very, very doable, and again, all of the two cost or more matters cards do work on these so like you can play blue lead the charge and then amplify the arc knight and it will have go again so lots of great value we get out of these cards since we do have viscerize just great rune chant engine on top of a bunch of cards that make rune chants we can run some of these really neat rune blade cards that a lot of the other rune blades don't have the luxury of running so that's the main board for the deck let's talk about the equipment so starting off here is our like perfect world ultimate greed equipment setup this is your starting point essentially if you think you can win the race this is the this is the equipment setup you are going with because 
this is going to maximize your efficiency. So first off, this is the only weapon in the equipment board. Uh, Rosetta Thorn, there's not a lot of reason to switch off this. This is the best rune blade uh, weapon in the game. Um, I mean, some of the other ones can compete with this somewhat. Um, Nebula Blade is very good, but the problem is this costs one to attack. Nebula Blade costs two, and ultimately I value that more than some of the other conditions on those different weapons. Now, it is one of the harder ones because you do have to play a non-attack action card and an attack action card to get the second half of Rosetta Thorn, whereas some of the other Rune Blade weapons have easier conditions to meet. But the upside is so big. This swings for two no matter what, and then if you've met that condition, it's going to deal two arcane damage. Now, what's important about that is that's one source dealing two arcane damage, so a lot of people going into rune blades will be a bit greedy and take only one source of arcane barrier because in theory that can deal with all of your rune chants because each rune chant is an individual source of damage. This is a good way to punish that. And people will do that a lot against Viscerai because they know he's going to be rune, rune chant focused. So Rosetta Thorn is a way to be like, well, you can't absorb all of this. And that one point of damage will make the difference often. So that's just really, really good. And we can pretty easily accomplish the conditions to do that. And it costs one to attack, which is just awesome. We, we love cheap attacks. Now, Hope Merchant's Hood is our ultimate greed one because, in theory, it's going to do more for you than Crown of Dictomy will do. Um, that is in our sideboard, but Hope Merchant's Hood is more beneficial for us if we think we can win the race because it helps us fix bad hands. And the big, the big hands that qualify as bad is going to be when you pull all reds, uh, because our stuff is very expensive and all reds can be very hard to work with if you don't already have a bunch of rune chants and they're cards that will end up being free. So this lets you fix those kind of hands. But more importantly, if you have all non-attack action hands or all attack action hands, you can use this to fix it to, so you can get that balance of some non-attack, some attack. That way you can trigger Viscerai and keep the engine running. So that's the big reason Hope Merchants is here as your first choice, but it is the easiest piece of equipment to sideboard out, depending on the matchup. Aether Ironweave, we don't have any sideboard options for this because this is just the best card for Rune Blades and equipment because it's battle-worn, so you can get a free block off of it right off the bat, which is great. Um, some matchups, that's not going to be as relevant, but the fact is the action part of it will always be relevant. We are very expensive um, with our cards. Our attacks, a lot of them cost two or more, um, or actually, for the most part, a lot of them cost two which is good because Aether Iron Weave generates exactly enough resources to pay for one of those attacks. So it is nice for, like, if we can give Go Again to a smaller attack to then crack Aether Iron Weave to get two resources for the following attack because it does require you to play a non-attack action card and an attack action to crack it, but that is usually what we will have to do anyways to get a second attack. So it's pretty easy to hit the conditions and does great things for us. Then we have the piece of equipment I keep talking about, the two cost matters, Goliath Gauntlet. You just destroy it, and your next card with two or greater attack gains plus two. It's one of the easiest uh, gauntlets to take advantage of and get a, a greater than plus one benefit out of. Um, Stubby Hammers is just bad in our deck. It's great in Chain, because Chain can usually get multiple uh, value out of it, and obviously this is better than Cracker Jack. So there's a number of attacks this doesn't work on in our deck, but most of our attacks, Goliath Gauntlet will work on, and we can always just hold it until we find the right attack. It's not a big deal. So it's just a great way to make our big attacks even bigger, and it's particularly great with, like, Drowning Dire because we're going to give a Dominate, and so being able to give plus two to our Dominate attack helps kill our opponent. And then finally, we have Sutcliffe's Sweet Hides. Um, I am a huge proponent for Snapdragon Scalers, but this is not the right deck for it. We just don't have enough one costs to really benefit greatly from Snapdragon Scalers, and a lot of our one costs already have, like, with our one with our one cost, we have four copies of Meet and Greet, and they can already give themselves go again in theory. So we do have a lot of expensive attacks, so we just need to run the Sutcliffe Sweet Hides that, yes, it will cost us one extra to give something go again, but we can use it on, in theory, any attack. Again, we do have the condition we have to play a non-attack action card, but that's the whole point of the deck, so you should be able to do this in every single game you play Viscerai. So that's the, the big starting equipment. 
Now let's talk about the sideboard pieces. So if you're playing into some aggro deck that's going to be physical damage heavy, so you expect them to just hit you a bunch, that's where the iron hide comes in. This is just for decks that are not going to do arcane damage to you, but you think that they are going to be faster than you. There aren't many decks that qualify for that. Um, Warrior is probably one of the decks where you start to consider this. Certainly you bring in like the helmet at the very least because it's very easy for you to bring that in. So because Hope Merchants is doing the least amount for us with the main board. So you could bring that in there. But just in general, if there's any aggro matchup you run into where you can use a bunch of extra blocking, this actually gives you a way so all four of your equipment blocks for something because the Iron Hides will all block for two if you pay for them. And then the uh, Aether Iron Weave already blocks for physical. So that's a way you can go super heavy control, like slow down the aggro deck. Um, it does cost to crack the Iron Hide, but generally speaking it's not too bad because it basically lets you use a card from your hand to block that's going to go back into your deck instead of going into the graveyard which is nice now as for the arcane matchups we have crown of dictomy to replace our uh, head slot essentially if you go against another rune blade what you'll generally do is you'll drop your hope merchant's hood for crown and then you'll just call it good enough there because usually one point is enough for rune for uh rune blades although obviously as i mentioned thorn can get above that but generally speaking one arcane barrier will be enough for most of the matchups because even the non rune chant focused rune blades are usually dealing one point of arcane damage and for briar for example she has a lot of ways to increase that amount but she has to deal the one damage in order to do that. So if you can block the one damage, you won't take the increased amount. And then it does also have this random upside where you can get like a non-attack action and an attack action back from your graveyard. Problem is that action does not have go again. So it's pretty bad. That's why we don't run into any other matchups because Hope Merchant's Hood does not cost anything and does not ruin our turn or end our turn, I should say. So that's the big downside with the hood. I've never cracked it, but there is a theoretical world in which you'll want to. And then we also have no room boots and no room gloves because those are the next easiest slots for us to replace. Probably gloves is the easiest to replace and the uh, the boots is the least. But if you run against a wizard, you will want all of these sources of arcane barrier because they will be dealing almost entirely arcane damage and they'll have lower health so they're easier to kill. So you don't need the damage boost as much. So you just want the extra arcane barrier so that you don't die to crazy Voltic Bolts. So that's what they're primarily there for. You won't sideboard them in often, but if you see the opponent is playing Kano, you bring in the full three pieces of arcane barrier. So that's our sideboard. Let's talk about some flex spots real quick. First off, this is the one I'm most likely to change myself. Um, I talked about how the Iron Hide's not super relevant. Um, that there's a few slots where you could bring it in, but most places where you need to slow down the opponent because they're faster, they're actually going to be Arcane Barrier decks. So the Ironhide's not super relevant, so you can drop the Ironhide legs and bring in Reaping Blade, which is also not super relevant, but does have some niche moments where it will be good. Um, the big reason I've come around to even considering this card is that I have seen a number of lists where it could be relevant. Um, specifically, Red Zone Rogue put out a list for uh, Moonwish Sun Sunkiss um, Cano deck, which is a lot of life gain. So for a deck like that, you may want to bring in the Reaping Blade. And it is a decent uh, weapon anyways, because it pay one swing for three, so it doesn't have the like super upside of Rosetta Thorn, but it also has no conditions to do so. It just... One to swing for three every time. Um, and then you don't have to pay anything for the second half that prevents life gain. So this is definitely worth considering. And honestly, it's probably something I'll end up bringing into my Viscerai deck because it is easy to drop one more slot of Ironhide. Now, I also mentioned the Slogism went in to replace the Oath of the Arknight from the rare version. Um, you just need a blue pump spell. So if you prefer, you can always replace Slogism with Warmonger's Recital or Come to Fight Blue, which are going to have lower upsides, but they are going to be easier to cast. And particularly in this case, I would recommend Warmongers over Come to Fight, but both are reasonable if you feel you need to block for more. It's just Warmongers does have enough use to justify paying one for only plus one, because it does have the cycle back into your deck effect, which is very nice, but... This is definitely something you could replace the Slogism with if you want. Um, 
also for that same slot, sort of, is you could bring in Pummels, um, Blue Pummels, because it is a great pump spell. The big problem here is that then you'll be going from 16 non-attack actions to 14 non-attack actions, which is definitely suboptimal. So, I mean, another thing you could do is drop, like, maybe the Red Reek of Corruptions for two Blue Pummels. And then you have the the 16 non-attack actions, two attack reactions, and then 22 attacks, which is not bad. Um, but generally, the, the reason you bring in Pummel is it does make you more controlling. Um, you go down synergy, but you go up in controlling aspects because this just lets you give an attack action card with cost two or greater, which we have a lot of, the added benefit of making them discard a card when you hit them. And since it's an attack reaction... It's after they declare blocks. So they may have just blocked an attack for three and been like, oh, I'll take the one. It's not a big deal. And then you slam it with this. Well, if they don't have any defense reactions, it's too late for them to do anything about it. They're going to get hit. They're going to discard the card. So that's really good, especially since it also comes with plus two. And it only costs two for that bu that buff. So it's pretty easy to get away with. Again, the reason I'm not running it is because my, my take of Viscerai, my build of it is very synergistic focused and... I'm just a little hesitant to include attack reactions. Um, my original version of Viscerai did have attack reactions in there, and it definitely got punished for that on more than one occasion. Since we really, really need to be creating auras every turn, we want that non-attack action into attack action. So that's why I'm not running Pummel. Definitely can justify running it. Again, I would either replace the two Slogisms or the Red Reek of Corruptions. And then finally, there's Arcanic Crackle Blue. You could replace Singeing Steel Blade with this. That's one thing I could think of. Um, there's a number of reasons I haven't done that. First off, with the benefit, this deals one arcane damage just like Singeing Steel Blade does, but it costs zero. So it's easier to play this attack. If this is the only card in your hand, you can still play it and do something, which is really, really nice. And with the arcane damage, it's actually kind of likely to deal damage to the opponent, which is nice. The big downside here is that one, it does one less damage than Singeing Steel Blade. So if they don't block this and it hits, you're really not chipping them for much. And then second, it costs zero, which means only the red lead the charge will give this go again. Whereas Singeing Steel Blade gets go again from yellow and blue. This one will only get it, or what, from uh, red and yellow. Um, this one will only get it from red. So it's harder to give this go again without, you know, using Sutcliffe Swede Hides or something like that. So that's the big reason I've chosen not to run it. But it does give you better, like, one-card hands where you can, like, when you you reach the late game and you have to block more heavily if your opponent's not dead yet and they're doing a bunch of damage to you, um, which can happen in the aggro matchups. This is nice because you can always block with three cards and then play this. It doesn't require anything else because it costs zero, but... Generally speaking, I find Singeing Steel Blade to just be better because of all the other synergies in the deck. And that's my Viscerai deck. So this is, again, a go tall aggro deck version of Viscerai. Heavily focused around Rune Chance, although it's not like... You, you could be more focused around Rune Chance, but I think this is the healthy amount of focus around Rune Chance. So I hope everyone likes the deck. If you want to see more deck guides like this, I'm probably going to start doing this a little bit more regularly. Um... Again, I wanted to do Dash, and I probably will do Dash next, but I just have to kind of tweak the deck from where it originally was. It's a really solid deck that I love very much, one of my favorite decks to play, but Everfest brought a lot of new tools for it, so I just have to revamp the deck, like kind of see what new things can come in and what I can get rid of and, and really knuckle down on the deck before I'm comfortable doing a guide on it. So that's why we're starting with Viscerai. This is also one of my favorite decks. I foiled out almost the whole deck in paper myself, I just don't have a foil Rosetta Thorn and Viscerai yet. Um, one day, <laughs> probably. But um, yeah, I foiled out the whole deck because this is just such a fun Runeblade deck to do. So if you enjoyed the video, leave a like, comment below, and uh, subscribe for more Flesh and Blood commoner content. <laughs>